along to one of your, you know, or one of the other friends' sessions and, and even sing in the background. But Is I, that your phone, Brian? I actually genuinely... It's what you said about three minutes ago. Go on. Um... Hello, everyone. Welcome in to the Beyond Book Show with myself on this warm and muggy Bank Holiday Monday. I'm Tony Higginson. I'm joined by three of our regular panellists now. Young Brian Gibson up there in sunny Everton. You're looking very healthy tonight, Brian. Thank you. Been in the garden all day, Tony, for about did, were they your, five hours. Were they your lawn clippings I saw on, on Facebook? Probably. Did you have a big bag of lawn clippings? <laughs> yes, I did. did. I didn't even know they had gone off on Facebook. because yeah, my hay fever played up and I live six miles away. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a friend of mine called Jenny and she got right. She usually has rabbits. And so I tried to get in touch with her to say, I've got loads of hay if you want them. Yeah. So why not? Why not? Waste not, want not, as they say. And, and poet and writer Zoe Dalton is, is, is joining us as well, I do believe. Are you there, Zoe? She's disappeared. She'll have to say hello in a minute. Way. She'll be back. She'll be back. No and way. Liverpool singer-songwriter and all-round good guy, Andrew Hesford. <laughs> you, yes. Hello. Hello, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and David Holden <laughs> is, is, is about to join the room. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about how and why we write. And, you know, is, is there a difference between writing poetry or writing you know, a press report or, or a novel or a short story, or indeed the words of wisdom that the people like um, poets like Zoe and Brian and songwriters like Andrew and Dave and, and such like do. I've got a few th things lined up to throw in to see what you think of them. Uh, but hopefully Andrew was talking just before we came on air, a very fascinating um, account of, um, I said to him, Eric Sykes, he was deaf, wasn't he? Now, Andy, Andy works in this field or did when he works. So, Andy, can you remember what you were telling me about um, the hows and whys of Eric Sykes? Well, actually, as you know, if you get any degree in malnutrition, it has an effect on your um, body systems. So it can be that if you've had, say, for example, a long exposure to um, any kind of carcinogenic, there's cancer-causing problem. Um, a good example, as best Nice. Um, or you've had an exposure to something which has um, affected your hearing, especially loud noise, you know, which is a problem in industries. Those things can affect your, your function for a long time, in fact, probably till you pass away. Now, in the case of Eric Sykes, he was so starved, he was really in quite deep trouble. Um, not long after he left the, the uh, but he was actually um, losing his hearing and his eyesight. And in fact, luckily, there were a lot of friends who all got demobbed at the same time. And the people who got demobbed all helped each other. So they'd all like sort of say, like Spike Milligan, um, someone and said, oh, uh, by the way, you know, so say you're not well, but you know, I need, I need a script. You, you couldn't get a script for us by the end of the week. Was it on? Oh, it's on then um, Father Christmas. This was June, you know, where it was like sort of any excuse to give someone a five or a tenner and keep them going. In Eric Sykes' case, um, he went to see Bill Fraser, who um, some people will know as being uh, one of the characters from Booty and Snodgy. Booty played and Snodge. Snodge. Yeah, um, opposite Alfie yeah. Bass. And um, Bill Fraser was well known as a sort of ensemble player in a lot of um, variety shows. He couldn't get Sykes apart in this variety show, but he did say, oh, well, Walked me not on that, and he's putting on all his makeup. I says, Here, here's, here's some money. Go and, go and get from the local um, delicatessen a plate of tuna fish sandwiches. We'll have a cup of tea and have a chat. And then by the set of time, the second I'll, 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 have, I'll have eaten and had something to drink. And you can watch me for the wings. So Sykes went around, got the tuna fish sandwiches, came back. He said, I'll put them on the table over there. And here, here's a cup of tea. And so Bill Fraser still. Applying this Leichner makeup, you know, and wet white, which is what they used to use in variety, so the lights caught you better. It's like a sort of completely white thing, rather like putting on white emulsion, but it's got like a slight shine in it. And, you know, I know that because my dad did repertory work, you say, no stuff like that. But what then happens is Sykes is like piling these tuna fish sandwiches in, and, and Fraser's watching them a bit slyly. 
And um, he he polished a lot off. And uh, he said, oh, did you? No, no, no matter, I wasn't angry anyway. Could you write me a few lines for a variety act? Um, it's just, I'm doing this thing in this next play. You know, it's father, would you go and write this for me? I stay here. It was a freezing cold winter's night. Stay here with us. I watch the show for the wings and we'll have a, a drink afterwards. And that was how they kept each other alive. In, in Sykes' case, the damage had already been done in terms of mastoid cavities and things. And he ended up where he wore these peculiar glasses. Now, the glasses had a hearing aid in them, which touched on the temporal bone on the head. It's what we call conductive hearing, because you're hearing the two stages. It has the acoustic part, which is moving to waves through the air. Uh, what they call standing waves and you've also got the bass notes which are received by your skull your skull if you cut over your ears you could still hear the bass notes in your voice try it now go on and audience out there listening talk say something like the quick bell hello hello hello, hello. Look, uh, dave this is a serious experiment so put your hands over your ears and say a phrase did you see the point of what he was making there? So that was the type of hearing he had. And he can actually um, bring up the high frequencies. So they got us near to a balance between bass and treble notes and nuances within the voice. So we wore these rather peculiar glasses. And the glasses had hearing aids in the arms of them, but no glass. Right? And um, he used them for quite a long time. And everyone used to skit. He said, oh, no, the hearing glasses. He said, I can't say a thing without them, but they're just hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I'm very If you watch any of the tweets which are going around the channels at the moment, I think they're on their yesterday channel, or was it Forces TV or one of these? If you watch any of these shows, they're as fresh as they were 40, 50 years ago. And there's a great one, if you see it, which stars Peter Sellers as um, an uh, interloper. Taking out what he still loves, um, takes it for happy, happy jokes. You know, I mean, there's, there's things like that where, um, I mean, he invented the one where you got your toe stuck in the bath in the tap. You know, and he had to take him into hospital still in the bath. That's right. I so remember that. I remember <laughs> that. Are you a vice chancellor of a university of comedy? Michael he, Crawford was the natural successor to all of that, wasn't he, really? You know, anything that could go wrong would and did go wrong. And he did all his own uh, his own stunts, didn't he, Crawford? He was quite a remarkable uh, guy, I'm really. You see, let him do it. The way you see, you see, there's one where he's hanging over a cliff on the back of a Morris Minor. You know, it's, and I mean, it's easy to remember that everyone skitted Frank Spencer. I mean, most of the, of the impersonations were Mike Yarwood doing impersonation of Frank Spencer. Like, mm, Becky, you know, don't know what's in me, Barry. You know, all kinds of stuff. Well, it, it's like the dangerous thing is someone skating all over the place and then going under a lorry and then going into a set which promptly destructs on the moment he hits the wall. Um, it, it, I actually found there's some elements of those shows I find now a little bit like, cringy bit. I actually like it because... It was at a time where people weren't afraid to do things like that. Nowadays, it, it's like everything has to conform to a code. It has to be... Well, they're uh, not past the health and safety regs anymore, would they? That's the thing. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember Charlie Drake? Jo yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. Well, he did a stunt. Andy might, uh, sorry, Andy will, but Dave probably doesn't. Dave being, yeah. being merely 23 and all, you know. Well, I, he was like a pre-runner as yeah, well. Charlie Drake. <laughs> Oh, and how many drinks do I owe you for that one? Oh, several. <laughs> several. <laughs> yeah, he had, to do a, he had to do a stunt where um, he used to go flying all different places. And then there's one where he had to go through a window and something happened. Um, and he, he had to done something to his back. But they had to shut it down and rush him to hospital because he, he had to cut himself on the or something. But something major happened at that time. I think, I think, I remember it being something about a bookshelf. The bookshelf was meant to collapse, but the, the set carpenter saw it and went, well, that's going to fall apart. And it's a live program. So we fixed it. So it wouldn't fall apart. And we dragged Charlie Drake through it. And the poor bloke got injured because 
of course, like all carpenters, it wasn't a matter of inch and a half, eight screws. It was like the longer screws you could get and then putting like metal reinforcements in the shelves. So it, it, it practically, practically caused them some damage there. I think- Yeah, that's right. There, were, there must have been several, you know, at yeah. oh, that time. So what, what we're going to do, guys, is um, we're going to have a little talk about how how we write or what we write or even when we write, really. I'm just going to share something for you. I'm going to play about a minute of what could be called the original. And then I'm going to play a minute or so of what we call the classic version. And we'll see if we can, um, well, you'll, you'll know them both instantly, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll have a little talk after we've had a little, uh, have a little uh, play here. Hold on. The first time ever I saw your face I thought the sun rose in your eyes And the moon and stars were the gift you gave to the dark and empty skies, my love. To the dark and empty skies. Mm. 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 So we, we could finish the show now then, couldn't we? Because that's good enough, isn't it? Nice. Oh, that was, that, that's a great way to end it. Uh, isn't it? We, I know, no. I, I thought we should we should start at the top and roller coaster all the way down for now. Now, well, I, I mean, just Brian. I mean, so the first version I have on record was written recorded in 1957 by the Scottish father of Kirsty McCall. You, you and McCall. Really? Do you, do you remember it as an early song when you were when you were a lad listening to the radio and all that? No, no, I don't remember that as a dog. No. That was quite quite traditional, wasn't it? Yeah, that, it's from from a, an album of traditional folk, um, you know, songs sung by Peggy Seeger. Andrew, is that a, a hint for you? Oh yes, of course it is. But there's an interesting so there's point here. Origin he wasn't... story. So you tell me what you think is the origin story. Um, I'm not sure I know the origin story. I only know that Ewan McCall was actually from Salford. He was not Scottish. But there was an imposition, um, which is referred to in B-Swing by Richard Thompson and also in Chronicles Volume 1 by Bob Dylan. And that is that Ewan McCall um, made a rule that songs had to be from the indigenous area they were from and had to, they had to be authentic. And if they were played on lute or played on, I don't know, a sort of, you know, anything you like. If you're playing a mandolin or lute, you had to play played each time on a mandolin or lute. So he was into the authenticity of it. But I felt it was devalued a little bit by him claiming to be Scottish. He may have had Scottish ancestry somewhere in the family, but as far as I know, he was from Salford. Well, I mean, dirty old town and such like, um, and, the, and the, the, the Lancashire, the, the Rambler, the Rambling song are definitely northern now he it, there must have there must have been a link to scotland maybe maybe his first tour was there but no the reason there were two reasons given for why he wrote the song so did you did you catch the 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 first time ever i saw your face the, the the clip we played yes yeah um so the original was written by ewan mccall who's Kirsty's dad uh back in 1957 and at the time he was having an affair with um pete seeger's wife um Pe peggy seeger and um. She was in a, a production and they desperately needed some some songs for her to sing. And basically she thought, well, I can't really ask, um, can't really ask Pete because, you know, I'm about to leave him. I know what I'll do. I'll ask Ewan to, to, to write me a song. So he wrote, in, in my opinion, what could be called the greatest love song of all time, really. I mean, uh, you know, I think every word in it is a, is a perfect word. It's a, certainly a song I wish I knew how to write. Dave, do you, do, you, do you remember the Roberta Flack version? Is that one you've heard um, before? It's the first time I've heard it, and it was definitely my favourite out of the two versions there because, it, I mean, Andrew knows about this, but I'm currently undergoing vocal lessons for oh, singing yeah? because I've never oh, felt cool. um, 
uh, that my vocals have been my strong point. And one thing the lady who's been giving me lessons has said to me is that if you try too hard to replicate the original singer when you're doing a cover, you'd never get it right either. You never do the original justice, but you also never do your own vocals justice because you're trying too hard to be somebody else rather than being you. And the Better Flax one, it just felt more like a complete song, whereas I think the first version <laughs> sounded more poetic. Mm. Um, yeah, I think you've got a point. With the yeah. spaces in Roberta Flack's song between each of the words, just to let the music almost catch up, if it were. Yeah. I mean, the record uh, producer that she was working with, because that was her de- off her debut album in 1969, and it, it became a hit. It was used in the film Play Misty for me, Andy. Yeah. Um, c- c- and c- that was a full scene. It was a full scene. And yeah. um, you joined us. Yeah. It's a stalker. After this radio presenter, I can dream, kind of. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. It was Clint Eastwood, wasn't it, in the film? Yeah. They they chose that song, like you say, to, to be used in the film. And because everybody who watched the film went, wow, that's a good song. They, they, they basically re-released it, but they added some more instruments to it when they released it the second time. The version I just played is is what you might call the strip back you know, I mean, it's purely it's sensuous, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you, you get a feeling from every word that she sings. Stripped back sometimes sounds better. Yeah. I mean, I mean, take a prime example, Fever by Peggy Lee. I mean, it's just a bass and a bit of percussion. And, 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 uh, you know, a, a yeah, it, click, it, it, it works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't really imagine anyone trying to cover that with anything more than that and do yeah. it justice. Yeah. It's one of those songs that's hard to... It's hard to divide it from Peggy Lee's performance of it. Mm. If have, anyone else is doing the impersonation. Have you heard the Peggy Lee song, Is That All There Is? Have you ever heard of that track? Many years ago. Do you know what? It's an absolutely I mean, fabulous record, that. Is that all there is? I, I, I always like folks who live on the hill. It was used yeah. in there, the film of Time in the City. And it, yeah, it, it was not about how do we make all these maisonettes and flats in the 1950s. It said about the, the folks who live on the hill, and there was a kind of irony in the use of it. But yeah. it was such a beautiful song to you. Yeah, favourite song of mine when I was a lad, that. Never know how much I love you. Never, Never know how much I can't. Okay. When you put your arms around me. I get a fever that's so hard to bear You give me fever When you kiss me, fever When you hold me tight Fever In the morning A fever all through the night Sun lights up the daytime Moon lights up the night There you go, Dave. That cheered you up. (laughs) <laughs> I think, I well, think it's just watching, a great song. Watching, watching Peggy Lee and listening to her sing that would cheer anyone up. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I hope you don't mind us saying that, Zoe. We, we don't always mean to be, um, you know, typical males. You know, I mean, you know, we, we all should enjoy something as wonderful as that, shouldn't we? Yeah. Zoe, you'll have to pick. You'll have to pick a song or something in a minute, and we'll we'll let you let you be in charge of uh, why we should like the words and like the pictures, shall we say? So have a little think of one you want us to, you know, play and talk about. And we'll, I'll, I'll line it up in a bit. <laughs> yeah. Going back to what you say, Dave. Yeah, I mean, simple works, doesn't it? I mean, that I think that's the, the reason. Absolutely. Um, Simpler the better. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you, you, you get these people that overproduce things and add so many layers on. And they were very guilty of it in the 70s and the 80s that... You know, a simple song structure suddenly became like an eight-minute, you know, epic. And you know, for for what reason? I think. Well, uh, another example that springs yeah. to my mind is uh, Layla by Eric Clapton. The yeah. original version, ha- and don't get me wrong, the original version was loved too. But the moment that the unplugged version came along in the nineteen ninety-two. Um, unplugged album, it almost split the fan base right through the yeah. middle. Some loving the first version, thinking, "Oh." The other one's too slow, it's too boring. But then the ones who love the unplugged version were saying, oh, that coda just goes on for too long. It's like, mm. 
the unplugged version just got the right feel and length to it. Yeah, well, he, he I mean, it, I don't know if I'm 100% right, but wasn't it Dwayne Ullman who actually played the lead on that? Yeah. And not, yes, not Eric Clapton. So although yeah. Clapton wrote it, it was Dwayne Ullman who, who actually plays the bit people think is Eric Clapton and, and is famous, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he, he influenced a lot of players with his slide playing. I mean, I think two examples I can think of. Uh, Joe Walsh was one example. From, um, partly from the Eagles, or yeah. later Eagles, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the Jamestown. Mm. And and what was the other one? I think um, Dave, something you were going to say. Was I think the same 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 band. Uh, another guitar player is no longer Don Felder. Oh yeah. Both, uh, yeah. Um, because There's a great they, clip they of him inc- playing solo doing Hotel California on a a twelve string. Guitar. A, a double neck 12 string and six string guitar in a church in in san francisco i think and it, it's just amazing it really is you know well it's also it's also um you know a three neck solo a three neck guitar you know it's like doing that solo part yeah even though everyone associates jimmy page with a double neck guitar really it's like this, this one plays pick up usually when you associate that with jimmy. But that solo was it's each one going back and forth and then coming together for that finale. It's I don't think it's ever but been done. It, well. I mean, both Layla and, and Hotel California are guilty of being too too long in inverted commas, really. I mean, much as mm-hmm. they're both great. I mean, Hotel California is six minutes twelve seconds or something, isn't it? It's a it's a and long about song. Six and a half, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then again, it's Again, it's down to the musical journey, the experience it gives you. And some people mm. will be of the opinion that if you took out like that solo from it, the song wouldn't be the same. You know, it would mm. just it would be losing something. I mean, another mm. another song that ta- is guilty of that yeah. is um, "Comfortably Numb" by Pink Floyd. Yeah, um, I have heard that being played over the radio at a service station coming home from Scotland. And they, and they cut edit the, out the guitar, do they? They yeah. cut the soul, the, the yeah. final solo out. Yeah. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. It's called the radio edit, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite, quite, they can be quite reckless with it, can't they? Really? <laughs> now, and Andy, here's the thing, though. You, you both um, write music and write, write lyrics, don't you? You know, you do both. So if you were writing Hotel California, so to speak, or, or any song, that's just the example we're talking about this moment. Where would you start? Would you start with the lyrics or or the chord structure or piano, you know, structure? Mm. Where, where do you start as a as your own songwriter, shall we say? I normally start with the, the lyrics. Yeah. It's it's often in the form of a poem. And sometimes, this happened on Saturday, actually, because there were a few problems with the scansion of the song. It worked well as a poem, but as a song, there were bits I had to alter. And also, um, some of the chord structures had to be altered. And I found I need the words first, and then you you shape the words to to whatever you come up with. Um, and it's funny, Dave and I were having the conversation about this on Saturday night. What do we start with first? It's nearly always the words. You know, and sometimes I've had an idea of a a lick or something I need to do, and I'm I'm actually trying to all the time think of how I can include that reflections like that. And um, also um, in between pauses, which you know was one of those. Have you got your guitar there? Oh, you should mention it. Well, look, I, I meant to say to Dave, I mean, can you play Layla or Host of California, Dave? Ooh, I, can, I can play the, the chords, but my guitars are. I'm in a substitute room tonight. So, oh, you are, uh, aren't you? Yes, you, you you're in a, a floral a floral lounge, indeed. We'll let you off. We'll let you off. You can always there'll be a get... different one next week. Don't worry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Don't have nightmares. Uh, and so, Andy, just just give us a, a see if you can do a little bit of um, a show and tell of um, how you come up with some lyrics, and then what what would you put to hmm. it as a strum to set the tone of the song and the rhythm of the song? I mean, uh, do they come to you automatically with from the words? Sometimes, sometimes. Because you, you, I've heard you alter fairly famous songs and do them in a, in inverted commas, almost like a comedy style. You've done a couple for me. You know, with big, lad hmm? The Big Onion song. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, was, there was one in particular that comes to mind, another one you're thinking of, actually. Um, let me just get the guitar. All totally loud, this, folks. It is. Okay. It is live and then recorded and then shared at a later date. <laughs> I 
just got to remove my three bases before I get yeah. the guitar. Zoe, so, so just just while Andy's um, delving into his guitar case, um, it, yeah. if, if there's a song that you think is one you'd like to talk to us about, about why you think it's well written or whatever, just pop it in the chat box for me. And I'll uh, I'll, so fi- I'll 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 dig it out. I'm not sure how to use chat box. Oh, okay. I can song. Which song? Sorry. Uh, Father and Son, Cat Stevens. Oh, love we love it. Yeah, we'll we'll get that one up in a minute or two, and we're we'll hopefully yeah, going to find yeah. an archive of um some some work that Brian was 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 working on as well. I think. Yeah. I'm going to delve into my archives and find something you sent me a while ago, aren't I? Oh, oh well, okay, that's fine, Tony. Yeah, if you stop can nodding it, off if it... just because it's hot and sunny, and you've got you've been out in the garden all day. No, no, I'm looking, I'm looking at something. Behave yourself. I was, I was looking it's still at quite early, you know. It's only just eight o'clock, right? I know. I, I know. It, you know, I t- I've worked hard today, Tony. Yeah, but about. Four and a half hours of mowed and dug. I know, and I know. Uh, yeah. I've done loads today. No, it's a lovely... I mean, I went out yesterday to Aldley Edge and I came back and I'm all set to go straight to bed. I, my, my, like Andy's forehead's a bit pink today from whatever he's been up to. I, I could just feel <laughs> my skin and my eyes giving up on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. well, <laughs> what, you, what, you, what you're hitting us with, Andy? Tell us what you're doing. Well, I'll tell you what, there's something you just mentioned there by... By our friend there, we are by um, Zoe. Let me see. It's not time to make a change. Just relax and move slowly. You're so young, that's your fault. There's not much to have to go through. Find a girl, get a If you want to get married, you have me. No, father and son. There's actually a, there's actually a, what they call smoker in it. It was written for a film called Revel Russia, and um, Revel Russia. It was meant to be a song about, from start to finish, a conflict between a young man, a father and son, as if it's like a conflict between Mother Russia and the youngsters who don't want what the old people want there. So there's an awful lot of parallels in it. It's a very clever song, and it's been covered many times, so it has a universal theme. It's always about misunderstanding between generations, but it, it's actually, I would say in many ways, it's as good a song as Wild World off the same album, um, which Wild World was Tillerman, actually isn't it? a single. Tea for the Tillerman, steak for the sun, wine for the woman who made the rain come. You know, uh, I, I mean, I, there's one I like from the album called uh, Miles From Nowhere. Um, and Miles From Nowhere is about a spiritual journey, like on the road to find out. So you can kind of tell he's, he's heading in a direction. And, of course, we all know about his spiritual reawakening and his uh, commitment to Islam. Yeah, just before you play one well, of yours, I, I, Andy, I, just before you, you do, do one of yours, as Zoe, Zoe picked this, so I think it'd only be right for us to play a minute or two of, of what you might call the original. Well, there, well, there we are. What a wonderful Thank song, you. Zoe. Can I just say, Tony, that yeah? that guy, he, I've, got, I've got a mate called uh, David, or, uh, he lives in, in Spain now, he was the absolute spitting image of him. Yeah. Absolute. Well, and he, even, he must have been I, as popular as when I was Brad Pitt for two weeks when I was in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I went out, but you look like Brad Pitt. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's a true story, Zoe. We went on holiday oh, about 10, 10 years ago now, maybe 12. And the first night at the hotel, they do the uh, you know the karaoke and all that. And they had these games and they wanted people to join in. So my kids being my kids said go on dad you go on stage you'll be you'll be dead funny you go on stage so anyway i go up on stage and the spanish compere more or less says something like ah oh, who's this here this is brad pitt so i just ended up being here. <laughs> and we did it to knock out it was great fun really was fun anyway every time we went out for a walk around the holiday resort um anyone from our hotel who saw me just started you know hola brad pitt oh, brad pitt <laughs> So we've got all these people in, in whichever resort we were in, I can't remember where it is now, looking around thinking, where's Brad Pitt, where's Brad Pitt? And you've got all these, there were mainly Spanish people in the hotel, you see. Uh, we got upgraded from a, a three-star to a four-star. 
And uh, so they all come and running over to me saying, oh, Brad Pitt, you were you were brilliant. You were brilliant. The kids loved it. My <laughs> wife hated it. The wife hated anything like that. She hated anyone in Tesco just, stopping uh, me, asking me if a book was in or anything like that. But Tony, yeah, you, you reminded me then because when I, I Francesca and I went to Spain, right? Um, and we went to watch a show, but you was in house and thing. And they had these dancers on stage and a guy and they had these long pieces of string with these solid balls, like billiard balls on. And they were, they were swinging them round and clacking them on the floor, clack, 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 like that. I was I was clapping away and yeah, and all that stuff. And the next minute, one of the women comes off stage, comes over to me and takes me hand and takes me on stage, right? And gives me a couple of these clacker ball things. I just kept on hitting me head, hitting me legs, hitting me up. Well, the audience was in raptures. They thought it was so funny. And they had lumps on my legs the next day. Yeah. Francesca was in the audience laughing. But um, oh, just you just really. reminded me of it then. Yeah. Well, this is totally the fun, isn't it? That. You've got to join in. I mean, you know, when you go on holiday, Zoe, do you, do you, do you get up and join in the sing-alongs and things? Absolutely. I mean, come on, though. Is it any other way of doing it? Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. This though, is definitely yeah. the right answer. Why not? Yeah. See, it's all right for Andy and Dave, because they can get up and get a guitar or a piano thrust at them and do something, you know, creative yeah, with it. More Dave than me, I think. Yeah. Piano, yeah. <laughs> so, Zoe, so, so what, what is it about Cat Stevens? And, is it that song or is it Cat Stevens that you just... Say that really... song just holds, like... I love the language. I love the fact it's really poetic. But um, I used to work in care homes and it was one of those things where if I had had a really bad shift, I was picking me up, it would always play that song. And I just love it. I love the fact that there's so many meanings to it and the whole sort of conflict. But unlike a lot of songs, it's not an angry song, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's just, the flow of it is just, it's beautiful, it's reassuring. I mean, I love Cat Stevens anyway. I just yeah, my mum my mom and dad were both big fans, so I grew yeah, up listening to Yeah, he was great. He was great. I liked him too. Cat named Dog, what was that? Dog named Cat or something. Is it, oh, is I love, yeah. I love my dog as much as I love you. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I always loved them. Um, you know, on the on the album Catch Ball of Four, I always loved the song called Sitting. And since then, my daughter Lucy watches a lot of American things, especially Netflix and things like that. And there was a show in which the word, the song setting was used. And she goes, oh, this is really good. And I said, um, I know that one. Do you know what you mean? I said, it was a Cat Stevens song. Who's Cat Stevens? <laughs> I mean, I, I, but it was There was a little known fact. You know The Office, the um, Ricky Gervais series? Before oh, yeah. They, before they settled on the use of handbags and glad rags, you know, for the intro, they were going to use sitting by Cat Stevens. But they couldn't get the permissions for it. No, well, he's only just come back to, to reality. That it's fifty years since that was released, you know, Andy. Yeah, um, and he's done a new version of the whole album, which is well worth a listen. Um, I mean, the the new version of um, it, it's a wild world is um, is superb. It's 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 gone for a totally different style, a sort of French chanson stop, stop, style. Stop. Yeah, I, I quite like. I've actually got a single. I was trying to find it when you were talking there, um, which came off a record store day last year, and it was um, the, the song "If I Should Die Tonight" was used in the film called Deep End, which starred Jane Asher. Um, and Deep End was about these people who work in a bathhouse in London, you know. And, and, and uh, "If I Should Die Tonight" was a different version of the film than it was in the album. It was only about one minute. 50 on the arm, I think, or not even that. Um, and they found a longer version of the film soundtrack and issued a limited edition single. And because they copied the artwork of Deep End, which was in blue and green um, toned yeah. like waves, like, they actually used that in the single as well. And the single was pressed in this lovely shade of blue. I can't find it at the moment. And I know it's in there. Um, but when you've got like the best part of 10,000 records, it's a bit hard to find some things, really. Um, but I, I I, love it. I've always loved Cat Stevens stuff. I think the only time I got really lost was when he did an Anthony Tanner. 
I've got two minutes then. But um, there was a thing called The Hate, and I didn't really relate to the album much. But um, Bludger and the Chocolate Box had um, a great song called Oh Very Young. You know, and I, I always think Oh Very Young is actually quite, it's quite a sad song, but it's happy. Um, it's about someone passing on, you know. Was it? Oh, very young. Why? Why did you leave us this time? You're only dancing on the surf for a short while, you know. And uh, I think that it, it's it's gorgeous. And again, it's like the Roberta Flack version of the first time I ever saw your face. But simplification, it reveals, it strips back the layers and reveals the actual beauty of the song, you know. And uh, I, I mean, I did that with a recent recording I did of to, to say goodbye, because I always thought I don't want to embellish this. It's, it's, it needs just bringing over. And in fact, um, Mark DeLacy did a great job on the soundscape at the back of it. But I would never have done any more than that. It, it wouldn't have been a band recording. It would have been like a, a sort of either an orchestral thing if I could have afforded it or some yeah. strings. But, but, I mean, you, I mean you, well, am I right in thinking that um, in this week's Reverb Nation chart, you're still actually holding on to number one spot? I'm, I'm very flattered and pleased. It's cool, isn't it? Well done. Yeah. Well done. Congratulations. Right. I, know, I, I mean, I'm really, I thank you very much for your good wishes. I'm really flattered and pleased. But the problem is, I'm aware that it's only a chance. And if you get to the point where you go to number two, it doesn't mean you failed. Just you've got to move over and let someone else have a go. Of course you um, But I, it, it was like the amount of things I've had from all over the world from people. And I think, I'm only just, I'm a retired nurse living in Hellwood. You know, I'm not, I'm not anything amazing. I'm not sort of trading off a past music career because. Oh, I, th- I would say we are amazing, Andrew. I would say you are. Okay, how much is it this time? Well said, yeah. <laughs> No, well said. And so, Andy, what are you going? Are you going to? Have you thought of something you're going to show us how you moved from A to B with it? Have you Have you got a little story behind what you're going to sing for us? Okay. I I would say the one of the influences in my early guitar playing probably about. 71, 72, 73 was Donovan. And it was because I'd seen um, a late night thing called Aquarius, in which they used to show, it was like a thing that Humphrey Burton used to present for ITV. And used to show all these little various animations and films. And one of the pieces was um, a Donovan song called The Old Fashioned Picture Book. And it was done, the animation was done by a writer called Johnny Byrne under the name Patrick. Now I'm not going to play that song because it's, it's one of those, I couldn't have justified a good performance of it. But there was a song which I did like when, when I saw a film called Poor Cow, which I'm going to do for you. Um, Carol White was in Poor Cow, along with Terence Stamp. Um, now, the song ended up on the B-side of Jennifer Juniper, and it, it was called Poor Cow then, and from the same name. But really, I think because of that, a lot of people missed the song. They didn't sort of relate to it. Because they felt it was um, in some way about farming or something. They didn't relate to it. Let me see if you can remember it. Okay? This is totally live, as I say. I am a boy from the North Country, far and near, far and near. And I dream of the girl with the sunshine eyes Where she'll be, where she'll be And then I dream alone And then I make a song And the memories that I've known and felt It makes the sadness melt And I wake up in a funny old kind of day the rain has gone away Watching the children sing and play In the garden and the roadway Up jumps a little one singing a song A friend she knows called Rosie Up for the green fields she must go Bring me one fine posy Sad as a heart on a wing Sad as a butterfly Oh, I dream in the north Of my songs and things Far and near, far and near, and I dream of the girl with the sunshine eyes, where she'll be, where she'll be, and then I dream along, 
And when I make a sound of memories that I've known and felt, it makes the sadness melt. I wake up in a funny old kind of day. The rain has gone away. Watching the children sing and play in the garden and the roadway. Up jumps a little one singing a song about a friend she knows called Rosie. Up from the green fields you must go, bringing me one fine posy. Sad as a bird on the wing, sad as a butterfly. Excellent. Well done, well done, well done. Oh, Dave, oh, Dave's that. moved house. <laughs> you kicked me out. <laughs> you, you might as well be outside. It's warm enough. <laughs> yeah. That well, was uh, lovely, Andy. Lovely. Well, that, that is an example of where, you know, where most guitars in the 60s tried to learn Angie by David Graham, which is an instrumental. And Angie is so complex. Uh, I've mastered it, but I couldn't sound any good at it. It's one of those most complex songs. And it has it has a resonance because it's like you could prove you were a folk player if you could play Angie. And uh, there are a lot of albums with that track on. Um, Sam and Garfunkel, for example, included it on, I think, Wednesday morning at 3 a.m. You know, it was one of those songs that you had to prove your chops that you could play. But I... I <clears throat> and acoustic clubs but I found them I found it was going back to the Hugh McCall thing it had to be authentic if, if you played a song and yes as a musician I do have one claim which may or may not affect your perception of me so we go on this let's go on this now I have an EP called The Singing City and Darth Spinners and one of the tracks on it is in my Liverpool home yeah now this takes explanation. Let's this still That's Paul McCartney's brother, wasn't it? No. No? In My Liverpool Home was written by a guy called Pete McGovern. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, when my mother-in-law and my father-in-law got married in September 1960, my mother-in-law's father had passed away during the war. He was killed in Anzio in 1944. So, she was close to her uncle, and her uncle gave her away at the wedding. My uncle was Pete McGovern. So I'm related by marriage to the writer of In My Liverpool Home. But it's a very tenuous connection. But the strangest thing was, I was introduced to him about a year before we did get married. And he was very poorly. And um, he had an oxygen mask on and stuff. And the case of, oh, tell him that he played a guitar. And I'm like, no. And the mayor suddenly comes to the phone. But he's not well. I can't discuss stuff like that when you're comfortable, Peter. You know, do you need lifting up in your chair? You know, do you want to drink a water? You know, because oxygen makes your mouth dry. And they're like, you're not a nurse now. He's got someone who does that. Will you please accept the reality this bloke isn't well? And afterwards, he got digs in the ribs, and you should have told him. It would have cheered him up. I felt, in a way, I regret not telling him, but in another way, I don't, because he really wasn't well. So, yes, I'm related to the writer of In My Liverpool Home. And, and can you play it? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, let me see. There's so many versions of it, though. But it was definitely written in 1963. <laughs> We speak with an accent, it's really rare. We tell the rest of the rich, it's really rare. If you want to complete your own, you don't want to spare. The end of our little home. Nice. And when he mentions Bridget McCann, his wife, I think it, it might have been something else, but his wife had a similar name, but not Bridget McCann. Um, so it was a bit biographical. Um, but 
I mean, put it this way, for someone, if I'd written a song like that, I think I pretty much could say I'm never writing another thing. You know, I was thinking of Lily the Pink, which is uh, the scaffold, wasn't I? Oh, yeah, but Lily the Pink is based on a rugby song. True. And, uh, you know, I mean, the idea of Lily the Pink, in any case, there is a truth, and here's another tenuous connection. Between 1997 and 2000, I was briefly married to someone else. I'm not quite doing any bait and tailoring. This lady's sister was Arlene, and she was married to Peter McCulloch, whose brother was Ian McCulloch of Echo and the Bunnymen. At that time, he was in a band called um, Electra Fiction. Now, I saw him many a time. We had a New Year's Eve party at Arlene's, uh, which is up to Broad Green Hospital. And he came round and he sat there with a pair of Ray Bands on. And he went to say, Happy New Year. Well, to Happy about it. The worst place I've ever been. You know, fancy that. Well, outside, all the McCulloch family used to follow a tradition of standing in the street and instead of singing the should old acquaintance, right, they would actually sing Lily the Pink. It's quite true, that. Efficacious, no less. Well, well, that sense. There you are, then. Go on, give us yeah. a blast of that, then. <laughs> I'll drink, I'll drink, a drink to Lily the Pink, the Pink, the Pink. <laughs> Yeah, I loved all these sorts of little things. You know where it says um, Jennifer Eccles had awful freckles and it made her rather shy. You know, where that line is actually sung by Graham Nash, who'd been in the Hollies. Yeah. She'd actually <laughs> sung on that record. So, I mean, um, that's a year before, teach your children well. <laughs> so, go on, Brian, what, what were you going to say then? Yeah, I was going to say, when, when Francesca was little, we were in New Brighton, and we were playing bowls, and Mike McCartney was there, right? And I started talking to Mike, and then he said to Francesca, I used to sing, I used to be with the scaffold, and he sang Lily the Pink to Francesca. And then he also sang, um, thank you very much for the entry. I and that one. He sang that one in the bowling alley in New Brighton. Well, I, I was like, he did, a, he did a solo album in 1974, The Warner Brothers. as recorded at Strawberry Studio in Stockport. And the band was basically Wings. It was Paul McCartney, Lid, the, the rest of them. Um, I think at the time, they might have had Jimmy McCulloch and uh, what was his name, Jeff Britton, come in because he'd. Had replaced the drummer and uh, the lead guitarist. But it, if you listen to Magia, which is the album I'm referring to, it's nothing so much than a very good Wings album. I mean, there's a great song in it called um, Giving Grease a Ride, and it sounds like T Rex. And there's one called Morton, which could belong in Sergeant Pepper. And there's quite a few things that which are co written with Roger McGough, which reminds me, here we are. Album from 1968, McGough and McGear. Um, and on this, it was produced by everyone, right? And Paul is on it, as are, you know, people from the Spencer Davis group and Graham Nash is on it. And also, um, just for the record, Jimi Hendrix. He plays on a, a home piece called Exile Student. So, you know, they, they had some heavy friends in those days. But they couldn't credit them because a record company in transients really. You know, just what you might like that. We're all quiet now. What have we done? Well, no, it's, <laughs> uh, I was hoping Zoe might talk about poetry for a minute while I'm looking for Brian's song. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry, are you okay? Yeah, well, well, you, you should have taken the cue from Roger McGough, Zoe. <laughs> well, I've written something as well, so I'll, I'll read something later, Tony, if you want. Uh, uh, go on then, Brian, go on. No, I'll, I'll read it later. Okay. It. Yeah. So wh where, what's what's happening with your writing at the moment, Zoe? Give, a, give us a little rundown of where you're uh, at and how you do it and well, such like. Basically, um, uh, I'm not a happy bunny at the moment, if I'm honest. Oh. I'm, I, well, I'm having a bit of a nightmare with this children's book. Oh, yeah. if, you, you know, if it's possible to develop a complete hatred killing synth of teddy bears 
That's me at the moment. You can't kill teddy bears. Uh, well, you, you say that, but if it's okay with you, if it's okay with you and I wouldn't normally do this, and I know it's not poetry, yeah. but can I just read you a, f- like a few lines? Of course you can. Story, and I would like your absolute honest opinion. Okay. Quite frankly, it is sort of, it is driving me round the bend. Yeah. But I want to sort of get it done for obvious reasons. Yeah. Feel free to fall asleep. No, don't be daft. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Go on. It's fine. Don't worry. Okay. Undivided attention. Really, very much appreciated. Looking outside, drops of the rain jumped and plays on the window pane, trying to brighten up a damp and dreary day, leaving the sort of staying in and playing with her toys felt much more appealing. Despite the norm looking forward to a weekly shopping trip, but he took took up breakfast, things started to feel a little brighter. It won't be as far as the mum says. We can have hot chocolate and cookies when we finish. How's that sound? Sounds good to say together and the smile plays with looks and lips. The room goes quiet as he's tucked in. When they've all finished, he goes put on the wellies and coats. And whilst the parents clear away, by the time the parents are ready, they're outside waiting at the door and shortly after this, they were on the car, in the car, on the way to town. Now, I know I've not put any characters in. Characters do exist to come in later. Honest opinion, that, what do you think? That reminds me of my childhood quite a bit because I remember how my parents would often be use that like as a, if you come along to this thing, well, I'll promise I'll, you can go to this thing yeah. afterwards if you come with us. So very relatable on that front. So very good. Yeah, I, I have a very, I suppose in some ways, I have a bit of an old fashioned childhood. Um, That's because yeah, you're old. Because... Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. It's See, usually me that gets that, so I don't mind tonight. Oh, shit, you got to cry. You know, so... <laughs> um, no, I had an old fashioned childhood, and I think it was the old sort of Pink Floyd thing if you don't eat your meat, you can't have your pudding. That's you know, right, and, uh, it, Pink Floyd, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was it was worse that being asthmatic and having to have medicine and the things that had to be done to get me to take medicine. And yet, of course, God punishes you for your naughtiness as a child. So I became a nurse and had to get children medicine and were reluctant to take it. Yeah. So, like, kaboom, right, got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like so, castor oil. He used to have castor oil, didn't he, years and years ago? Cod liver oil, oil after... Brian. Cod liver oil. And, no, castor Seven oil seas. before that, I believe. I don't remember oh, that. What, but it was wasn't castor that just oil. cod liver oil with sugar, castor sugar in? <laughs> no, no, just on its own. <laughs> no, that's what it is. <laughs> you know when you're, you're giving stuff like um, cod liver oil or castor oil and... Yeah. I remember sugar makes the head medicine go down. My dad worked for Ayrton Saunders, a pharmaceutical chemist in Liverpool, and he used to get all these things, and he got PKL. I've told Tony this, you know what's coming, don't you? And PKL, he used to give me, I was an orange liquid. I used to give me a spoonful of that with some sugar on it. Now, I used to feel incredibly sleepy and kind of, oh, I feel nice and relaxed now. Unfortunately, when my dad's lockup had to be emptied to move the car out of it, I found all these boxes, and there was a box of all these bottles of, of PKL. Painkilling liniments not to be taken internally. So all those years have been sort wow. of some kind of alcohol people poisoning or something. Um, but it was the type of thing you wanted to rub on if you, if you had, like, muscle ache. Nalgex for people later, or deep heat. You know, you know year, I remember years ago, it was the norm. It was the norm. When your little boy or your, your little girl wasn't going, going to sleep, you'd put a little bit of rum in, in their bottle. Yeah. And then it, or a drop of whiskey in the in the bottle. It was like the normal thing to That was to make to the baby go to sleep, wasn't it, Brian? That was it. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Right, so listen, guys, we're just going to have a minute or two of this. Ho- hopefully you can see the screen when I... Um, when I play I the music. Now. Okay, 
Okay, that's fine. Let's, Let's make it. Take one. Pal, let's go, man. Here we go. Let's play hard and strong. Oh. Peace, boys. Oh. Let's hit real hard on that very last day flat after we're tasked the second. Boom. Love it. Watch me on that part. Are we ready? Let's go. Stage five. Good vibration. Softly smile, I know she must be kind. So oh, Andy, have you, wow, got a have you got a theremin? That was brilliant. Have you got a theremin for when you do your album? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I did one track which um, I never finished, um, and I did the demo of it. It's called Snow Angel, and I wanted the sound like someone flying through the air, right? And I thought the most obvious thing is to go for a sim sound, but then a friend of ours who Dave knows called Mark Slater. And I said, oh, you know, I'd really love to use something like a theremin. He said, I've got one. Have you now? And it was like an American one. And he had this, there's one antenna, which it looks like a radio antenna. It's quite a thick um, antenna, quite a thick area on it. And there's one which is a loop. And what you do is you use one for pitch and the other for volume. So you go, and you want no. And you can make those those pitch and volume sounds. And I found it was like it, it's a very hard thing to play one. 
most people try and make it look quite theatrical. Mm. And the most common use, um, in fact, now is known um, to be the Midsummer Murders theme, as well as, of course, the vibrations. Um, and I, I always want to use something like an Anders Martin art and all those kind of things, you know, like really strange instruments, because once this is what I could get with them. But the pheromone, it caused quite a lot of um, consternation. It was like, why would you use a pheromone? I said, I wanted it to sound like someone flying. Oh, you can get that with string pad on a keyboard. So they wondered why I'd done it. I said, because it, I could. I did it because I wanted to. There's no more reason to do it other than you want to. But it was interesting that, um, you know, it was like once I'd mastered it, I really wanted one. I've got one in kiff form in the shed, um, which I'm trying to finish. And the kiff form, it's why with two diddy bits of wire, and that's your, you know, that's your area on your, pitch and volume and some rubbish you need something more than that um but i do want to get one and so then, i mean wasn't um i mean pet sounds and the beach boys was famously the song that made the beatles realize they needed to try harder <laughs> well at the same time it was a song um, the beatles album rubber soul and in term revolver made um, brian wilson want to try something different and he was going for an album which would the vibrations would have been included on called smile and it was lost for about 30 years, wasn't it? Yeah. I've actually got a copy of um, the reconstituted smile here. You know where they issued it? I think it was in 2011. Yeah. Um, and it, it, there were people who complained it wasn't quite the smile that was envisioned. But Brian Wilson curated it, so I think he knew. Um, but there were things like, like heroes and villains. Uh, but they kept the Beach Boys career going through 1966 and 67 by issues like. Um, then a kisser, which has nothing to do with the Beach Boys smile at the time. It's just something that was issued because he couldn't get an agreement to issue her Heroes and Villains in the States as he'd formed their own record label brother. And um, well, they, had, they had huge problems with um, the, the, the Timothy Leary and, uh, and and their management, didn't they? It was, uh, oh no, it wasn't Timothy Leary, was it? It was um, Charles Manson, wasn't it? Charles Manson, well, you remember we were talking about that one week. And Charles Manson had um, he'd been promised by Terry Melcher, the Birds producer, that he recorded the track. He was also promised by the Beach Boys they'd do something. And he did a track which I think was ceased to exist, and it was called Never Learn Not to Love. It's on the B side of Bluebirds Over the Mountain. And um, is, you know, hey, are we on our own here? It's all right. <laughs> and, um, what we want about them. <laughs> that's okay. Everyone's nipped off for a tea break. Um, but it was it was interesting that, um, on Velvet Tragic, that when Charles Manson got impatient about whether they were going to do any recording of them at all, he actually sent some other family around to, to basically find Terry Melcher. And they went to his house, but he wasn't there. But Sharon Tate, and Roman Polanski's wife, her friends were there. And unfortunately, they killed everyone, and there were... Slogans. In fact, this is where, unfortunately, a court case ensued in 1970, at which John Lennon actually gave some evidence, uh, because they they figured out that some of the things written on the walls pointed at songs from the Beatles, White Album, things like "Arise" from Blackbird and uh, "Piggies," uh, which are you know two phrases. <laughs> and th those two those two songs, amongst others. Helter Skelter was meant to be like the revolution which Charles Manson would lead. Um, and John Lennon said, it's all this rubbish. It was just the noise. You know, the reason why we wrote it was because we wrote a song so we could be louder than the who. It had nothing to do with killing anybody. But the problem was, as I say, if Charles Manson had found Terry Melcher in his home instead of uh, um, Terry Melcher having rented his home house to show and take the friends, um, it's it's quite shocking, really, that happened. It's quite unnerving that, you know, it happened at all, really. They, they had to be victims of circumstance. Um, but it, it, it's interesting that they did issue an album of Terry Mel sorry, of Charles Manson stuff year later, years and years later. There was a record label in this country trying to negotiate a reissue. And I thought, I'm not sure Take, I could... Taking it a bit far, isn't it, really? You know, then, for archive material. <laughs> yeah, but then again, there's another way of looking at it. And there's the 
they probably see what is the market for because people are looking for it, you know. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, isn't that the other thing going back to Eric Sykes? I mean, um, Brian Wilson's he's deaf in one ear, isn't he? So, his ability to hear the full scape of, of vocals and instrumentation, but literally only in, in pure mono, really, you know, because a lot of things were recorded in mono, but they had all the instruments placed around the mix. It was just they only came through one, one channel effectively, didn't they? I was trying to think of who the production associate was on um, Pet Sounds and on Smile. I'm not sure. Van Dyke Parks comes to mind. Well, Van Dyke Parks is very possible because, I mean, he he's, he was easily around then. I mean, I saw him with Ry Cuda back in the early 80s. Oh, grief. He's one of these people who's very much a cult figure in America, rather like P.F. Sloan. Um, he's, he's well known in the record industry in America, but over here he's a bit obscure. Kim Fowl is about the only one who's known in both America and Britain because of his involvement with things like um, not Rockabye people, one of the stingers. And also an early Cat Stevens one, Portobello Road, the B-side of I Love My Dog. I uh, thought you might like that. And an early Slade track because he was involved with the in-betweens before he became Slade. Um, uh, Ambrose Slade before they became Slade as well. Yeah. A friend of mine was married to Noddy Holder. S- small world. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Down and get with it, don't you? Yeah. Um, but I found it, I found it interesting also that um, Smile led to a, a kind of a couple of albums which the tracks were sort of spread throughout for about three or four years. There were things like Smiley Smile, Wild Honey Friends, Twenty Twenty Sunflower, and um, Surfs Up. And I think the best song from Smile, if you discount. Good vibrations, which everybody knows. The best song from Smile, which ended up on um, the Surf's Up album, is Surf's Up. You know, but the lyrics are quite obscure, you know, was it? A diamond necklace pays the pawn, you know. And then there's this refrain of, Are you sleeping, brother John? You know, so I don't know why that was included, but it, it actually suits it. It's more choral than anything else, but it's, it's fabulous, this piece of music. But it, it was it was obviously there's been tussles and they were like sort of saying, no, you've got to write more surf and hits, Brian. You can't you can't write these kind of things anymore. You know, they, this is all like you probably send around this all pat smoking music, boy. Don't write that kind of stuff, you know, is it? You know, and they're like the Beach Boys, Beach Boys are trying to go towards a countercultural thing where they appeal to people who are into transcendental meditation or vegetarianism or you know, macrobiotic food. I have a feeling he, going back to Timothy Leary, I have a feeling he, he, he went to see Timothy Leary for some um, some sort of therapy, didn't he? I don't know if I'm remembering that right. There was a great film about the making of all this that was on one of the channels I watched with my dad around Christmas time. And I'm sure he was under um, like psychotic drugs and, and, and you know, mind stimulation partly because of the, the mess with Manson and, you know, the, the deal that, that was meant to be going through. I think what, what we, we maybe have forgot to mention here is for a long time, Ryan Wilson couldn't perform with the Beach Boys, so they kept him in the position of being a writer and outside the band. So his contributions were like to occasionally write some amazing stuff like Sail on Sailor is a great song, if you can find that. It, it, it uses images of basically sailing, of being on a ship. Um, and it, it is a remarkable piece of work. Um, but again, I think it was Dan Van Dyke Parks and Brian Wilson wrote it because they just signed a, a new recording contract with Reprise Records to distribute Brother Records. And the, the first album they did was uh, Carl and the Passion So Tough. Which had a, you had need a mess of help to stand alone, and then they issued Holland, which was like an album and a half. It had an EP called Magic Transistor Radio. Yeah, let, let's have a. Yeah, I, um, they, Andrew, I, fa- I found it. So let's have a. They realize must, it was from the album you said, but this is the remaster.
seldom stumble, never crumble, try to tumble, lies a rumble. Feel the stinging I've been given, never ending. It was Van Dyke Parks. I, ch- I checked. I checked the the production notes. Yeah, your eyes. <laughs> yeah, but you see what I mean. That that album actually led to them having a three year hiatus, and the reason for that was because at that time there, were, there was pressure from the record company to sell records, and they thought with Brian being in a fragile state, he, he just couldn't write or produce anything. And also, there were disagreements with the band, unfortunately, Mike Love was the main instigator of it. And um, they ended up where, for a time, they became a touring band, an oldies band. And he did a lot of things, you know, around America. He even played Disneyland, I believe. And then in 1974, Capitol Records issued Endless Summer. And all of a sudden, this album caught on, especially as I think the release date was not long before or maybe just after July the 4th, Independence Day. And all of a sudden, there's people like, you know, singing all these songs because these are the ones that remind them of, of good times in the 60s. And there were things like Pum 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 and California Girls, wouldn't it be nice? Um, and all of a sudden, they became popular again for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> they weren't happy um, because they wanted to move on. And it ended up, of course, the following year, I think there was a reissue of a song in the middle of that year. And then EMI in this country started TV advertised albums. And the first album in the series was the Beach Boys 20 Golden Greats. I remember buying it. (laughs) Right. Uh, Predominantly blue and green colours. Back to Cat Stevens, but I might die tonight again. And of course, it was a number one album, a total and complete smash. And the issue um, wouldn't be nice to coincide with this. And to my to my, shall we say, understanding at that point, the Beach Boys got revived because, of course, there was commercial demand. We want Beach Boys records. And he did an album, the Beach Boys, I think it was the Beach Boys Love You. And one of the songs that was called It's OK. And they did a version of um, rock and roll music, Chuck Berry, but it was all on synthesizers. Right? So Brian Wilson had obviously got a grip of that. And he did a couple of hours before they had a hit again with um, Lady Linda in 1979. Um, but it appears, even though they were doing contemporary stuff, it appears that they're still regarded very much in the States as an oldies act. You know, and even when they did Kokomo in 1988, and if it hadn't been from doing Kokomo um, for the film Cocktail, the Tom Cruise film, there would be never be. Yeah. I saw them down at the at the tent on on King's Dock or whatever it was. Um, I think it was only Mike Love um, from the original Beach Boys, but um, Status Quo with the support act, which which was a bit strange. Status Quo Didn't opening for a version of the Beach Boys. <laughs> yeah. But I have actually got a record somewhere. When I can think of where it is, um, in 1979, Capitol Records in this country issued. Uh, the Beach Boys singles in such a way that you could buy them as like a series of oldies, you could buy a box set. Of course, one of the singles was a track by the Survivors, which was apparently the Beach Boys under another name. It was called Pamela Jean. Now, I've got that single. Um, how I've got it, I don't know, but I've got it. And it, it, it's interesting that um, when I think about where my life was in, say, 1980 when I got it, um, I was really interested in the collecting the records and the actual, you know, the idea of you know, the texture and things of the production. You know, I was, I was really interested in it. The only real negative I think about it was is that I mentioned to people and they go, never heard of it because it's about the survivors, but of course it's the Beach Boys. But the Beatles did this as well, you know. The Beatles did a lot of songs and in fact one was almost issued Pray tell. Okay. In 1967, the Beatles recorded a track called You Know My Name, Look Up the Number. It was issued as the B-side of the last Beatles single, Let It Be. But the original B-side was going to be What's the New Mary Jane, which was this rather strange track that had originally been recorded. I'll show you now. It was originally recorded for... um, 
you know, at the Beatles' White Album, but it was rejected out of the Rolling Order of the White, Al White Album. The interesting thing was, in 1969, the, um, John Lennon had issued a Plastic Owner Band single of Cold Turkey, and they were looking for a follow-up. So at that time, he'd had a split with the rest of the Beatles. He wanted a divorce, but he kept it quiet. But he thought, how do we earn some money from some of the old recordings? So he went to him, re-edited um, What's New Mary Jane, and You Know My Name. And it was going to be issued on December the 5th, 1969 under the Capastiono band label, with a, an Apple press release saying, and help from some of the leading show business artists of the day, namely people called Harrison, McCartney, Starr, right? And then what happened was he got pulled because the rest of the Beatles weren't happy at him using con um, pro um, recordings used on the contract as, as the Beatles, they weren't happy with it. And the, the single was pulled within about three or four days of the release. Whether I actually think it was pressed, I don't know. But the idea was it was going to be a Christmas single. Oh, they did that for three years on the run, didn't they? Mm. So there you are. Have you learned something there? Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah. You're going to find your version of it now, are you? I'm going to find... I haven't actually got a version of it. I'm going to find something to show you. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. Well, we are. We're, we're, we're watching you do your aerobics for us. While you, well, Andy, <laughs> while you're looking for that, I think Brian was saying he had a uh, a, a piece to uh, to um, share with us. What, what have you got for us, Brian? What have you written? Is this a oh. writing or, or a previous writing? Uh, well, it's one that I did through the week, I think. Um. It's just, you, you know, the ideas just come in your head and then you just write them down. You don't know where they come from, but, you know, they just happen. Um, but this is what I came up with the other day. You were walking down the alley with just bruises and sadness on your face and the beat was pumping from the club below. Your dress was torn in such distress and your hair was tangled in a mess. It was then I knew I could not let you go. In the shadows, he was standing there. I saw his eyes. I could feel the glare. As you tripped and fell and stumbled onto me. You held me tight on this dark night. And I felt your breath and your scent was sweet. And I heard the sound of running feet. I saw the slimy bastard run away. We found our way into the light of car headlights, glaring bright. The whole thing just seemed so unreal. And there he was behind the wheel. The engines revved, the car horn blared, and I felt her shaking, she was scared. Their fingernails cut in my side as onto the floor she did slide. I grabbed her before she hit the ground and I propped her up against the door and I heard the screeching tires go round as the car loomed up from out of the dark. He had just one thing on his mind. As I stepped aside, but not before, I grabbed some wood and hit the screen. I felt it smash and I heard the scream. His car zigzagged out of control as down the alleyway it did roll. A bang was heard. It hit the wall. No more sound was heard at all. Just a shadow slide from out the car. We stumbled from the alleyway and we are still here together to this day. Oh, wow, no, hey. That is really oh. good, Brian. Not not your normal sort of light-hearted thing at all, is it? No, it just yeah. came out. Is it based on a true story? No, it just came out my head. It's I really like that. Really... I picture it. That was really good, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, yeah honestly, very good. that was really very good. Very good. Yeah. yeah, really enjoyed that. Wow, well, thank you. Yeah, there was some good good imagery in that, and and it and it had a, a real. I'm going to say a dark resonance, but it, that dark isn't really the word I mean to use, but a bit of that feeling of darkness rather than it being negatively dark. What did you yeah. think, Andy? 
sinister. Yeah. You got the impression it was it was like dark streets, rainfall, like half lit alleys. Um, wow. That stuff it behind you. Sounds a bit like your 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 performance piece you did for Ian D. Hall, you know, with, with the dark alleys. Yeah. Yeah, well, all, all it needs is swan vestas in the background. Yeah. Andy, Andy, Andy's been learning a new instrument. He can play the double swan vesta now, can't you, Andy? Yeah, the only problem is I've not learned the full scales. I need to do the pentatonic scales on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I actually, Dave is a recent convert to uh, Tony Hancock because I had to explain where I got the idea from. And um, he said, it seems like a detective thing. I said, it's funny, you're right. You're absolutely correct. Well, it the one Brian thing, just done there, yeah. that just reminded me so much of like an intro to like a detective drama series or a murder. Really? Sort of wow. Thing. Absolutely. Just the opening visual scene to that. Yeah. What do you call, um, if I remember rightly, what do you call a cold opening when you make mm -hmm. a series? So in other words, you're given the, the scene setting and then it goes into the title sequence. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and the good news, Andy, you. is um, your song and indeed 19 others are being mixed as we speak, aren't they, effectively? Uh, we had the exclusive um, preview of the first three songs, <laughs> um, the single from Two Black Sheep, Facial Expressions, um, Dawn Oberg, a San Franciscan folk singer, her version of Here's to the Death of Pac-Man, and the wonderful Tom Moorcroft doing The Art of Melancholia. Um, and, you know, they're, they're being sent out to people who want to have a listen now and radio stations and the like. But... Um, can you tell us just a little bit more about the Listening Out of Earshot project? Because I think it's it's about time people knew a bit more about it. Okay, right. Um, what it is, it's a project where musicians are always able to go on, on the internet and they perform their songs and they perform as like three, four minutes at the camera. It's nearly always maybe against the background that Dave's got or maybe a background that I've got. And you send them out and people hear what you've done. But however... When you've got someone like Ian D. Hall, who um, is sort of slightly, he's, he's not the most confident of people. And also, he, he has had some health issues. How does he get to perform his stuff so people can hear it? And I thought, well, someone else needs to hear it, to perform it and hear it. And then I had this idea before Christmas, and I thought the one common point of contact we had was um, Tony. So I phoned Tony, and, you know, after usual pleasantries, um, I mentioned about this idea and I thought he's going to think I'm a bit of a lunatic. And he agreed that this was quite a good idea, that we do something to actually um, promote Ian's work, but also we can have people doing the songs as um, based on his work or on his influences. So, for example, Ian likes cricket. He is, you know, a very keen, um, very keen um so it's exponents of a lot of things, including Tony Hancock. We discovered a mutual love of that. Um, and he also has a way with words, which actually comes across people very strongly. And I thought, without him, I used the phrase habeas corpus, and it sounds awful, but it's like having a funeral without the body. You know, I don't mean that literally. That's not really the right thing to say. But, you know, how can you promote something without him? And then all these people stepped up to the hockey, and we had all been reviewed by Andy Hall, and we'd all met him. And I found him a most engaging fellow. I mean, I actually did a, a show for him at the Casa two years ago with them. Um, as we're talking, two years ago tonight, Tony. How about really? that? Yeah, two years ago, 31st of May, 2019. Gosh. And um, there was myself, uh, John Chatterton, and Ellen and Nelly. And we did the show, and it was like, um, for all the, the world... But it was one of those things where the atmosphere was great in the room and also Ian was on top of all. And we had we had a lot of I don't want to sound sickly, but we had a lot of love in that room. You know, the feeling that people felt a warmth towards it and understood what we were trying to do. And uh, we saw all sold quite a lot of Ian's books and quite a lot of individual CDs. And a few of our friends came to see it, like Rob Wright and Wright and Rob Jones. And Jamie Clegg and all those kind of people. Um, you know, so we had a really good night, and I thought ever since then, even in that intervening 18 months and all the lockdown, I thought, how can I show that we actually care about this bloke and you know, 
I think it's important to our scene in Liverpool. And I have this idea we need to do some kind of CD. A CD, because of the contributions, has now become a two CD set. Um, Tony's designed the cover and the booklet. Um, and we're, we've got to finalise a few details like credits and things like that. And also, when you get logos and stuff done, you know, you like to get them done properly. And um, Neil Gallagher is actually making the CD for us, and Mark Sebastian De Lacey has checked the EQ and the actual um, trap constructs to make sure it sounds really, really good. Um, so we're just a process of radio promotion now. Hopefully we'll have a fully mixed version this week and then we can start getting their CDs made in a view probably to a July release now. Well, it was 24th of June or, or any time soon after, wasn't it? Yeah. And I mean, we're looking at um, a concert in October of as many of the artists that we can garner. But we're okay. going to do something smaller that people can come to, to, you know, if he, if Ian can be got there and say hello to, you know, read a few of his poems, really. You know, because, I mean, you know, some of the people on, on it have literally just taken the exact words of Ian's um, creation. Um, Tom Tom Moorcraft, for instance, I mean, his, his version of, um, you know, The Art of Melancholia, and it, it, it segues into another piece, doesn't it? Um, imaginary friend. Imaginary friend. But it's it, it, your imaginary friend is an imaginary friend of your imaginary friend. It's a it's a cycle within itself, isn't it? It's very clever. Well, Andy, okay. if if it's all right with you, I'm just. Uh, can I play a bit of the um, the two black sheep song? I think I've got it queued got up. It. I, I think I would love to know what you all think. Okay, so let's see if we can get this working. In a tear, a lifetime sadness is shown. In a tear, all manners of images are exposed. In a tear, life can end. In a tear, Broken hearts mend In a smile Friends become lovers In a smile True feelings uncover In a smile People fall for strangers In a smile We face the greatest dangers Kiss 
children are made in all emotions. Our souls are saved. Whoa. Wow. What do we think, That's folks? Easy. Really good, beautiful, beautiful. Very good. Really good, isn't it? It's Ian, Ian Davis and Amy Chalmers are two black sheep, and Amy has done an amazing job there on all that uh, the string arrangements. And I think it, it so suits Ian's delivery, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. he brings every emotion out of some of those lyrics. Um, you know, so we're hoping that's going to get a fair bit of play from local radio stations. And um, you know, we're, we're it's it's up on Bandcamp, Andy, isn't it? It is. Yeah, under a, a, Ian's a granddad lived in Canada. And when he came home to live somewhere near Birmingham, I'm not sure where, actually. Ian, Ian seems to have links to various places around the country. But he had a plaque put up outside his house called the Adenak House, which is Canada backwards, you see. <laughs> and um, so we've called the company, if that's what, what the word you want to use, as Adenak House Productions. So if you go on Bandcamp and type in Adenak, you'll see a picture of Ian and the logo from the from his, his granddad's house. And um, there's that song and the other two uh, available to be listened to. Um, for a pound, you can download them. And all proceeds, Andy? All proceeds go to the Whitechapel Project. Which is, we um, you know, for the homeless in, in Liverpool. Um, so Andy and I had a meeting with a lovely lady called Ruth, didn't we, um, just the other day, outside in the sunshine after all the rain. And uh, she told us about the, how they run the project and, um, you know, was thrilled that, the, you know, this, this CD's coming together, you know, to, to raise some much needed funds for them. Because, I mean, they feed up to like 50 or 80 people a day, Andy, don't they? They certainly do. But it's the fact that in the towns we're living in, um, and certainly after, you know, a third lockdown period. And the problems of being present in lockdown, you know, we've been very much looking to ourselves and how we organise our own lives. But then you realise there's some people who don't have the grasp on that, they don't have the locus of control to be able to do that. And, um, you know, I, I thought it was important that, you know, we did something worthwhile and Ian wants to do this. And I'll be honest with you, you know, it, it's like I, I many a time I had to keep, you know, talking, but there was a lump in my throat considering everything they, they tried to do. And they tried to make applications for grants and all sorts of things. It's it's tough. It's a tough world out there to keep these kind of things going. So if we're, hopefully if we can play our part, you know, let's see what we can do to help them. Yeah. So That's please what. spread the word, folks, to, you know, your family and your friends. Um, go to Bandcamp bandcamp.com forward slash Adenak House Productions. Uh, we've had 65 listens to each of the three songs in a week, Andy. Um, and and a, few, a few downloads. I'm sure the downloads will start coming. Um, but, you know, it, it's great, you know, to, off, to, off to a start. And, you know, with a bit of help from everybody, you know, a little goes a long way, really. And, you know, the chance at some point in probably July, as, as Andy said, you know, we're trying to find somewhere that's safe and easy for people to get to hopefully Ian will be feeling like he can come along at least you know for for a short period of time and it'd just be lovely to um you know bring a few people together and you know say thank you to to, to uh, Ian and everybody who's we are working on it with the promise of fish and chips for oh, he likes fish and chips doesn't he yeah yeah <laughs> now, I, I promised Brian I'd try and share something that he was working on a little while ago so if you can just give me a sec this is where my, my use of internet and technology are. You've got me. Hmm? Smile, though your heart is aching. Smile, even though it's breaking. When there are clouds in the sky. 
That it, it's it's smile, Brian. After Andy talking about smile by the Beach Boys, that's lovely. It's lovely. Yeah, it is. The CD, oh. Mr. Smooth by our very own Brian Gibson, and uh, I think he does a cracking job there. He's gone all shy on us now. <laughs> Amazing. It really draws when it's like you can picture it so clearly. <laughs> It's it's excellent, Brian. I, I have no other words to describe it. Yeah, it's absolutely excellent. You're working on more stuff, Brian, aren't you? Are you? Are you? Yeah, I am. Um, that, that's it, that, 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 that's just it's. I know, and it might sound stupid. I know it's me. You know what I mean? But it, it, it when I did those see that, that, that <clears throat> oh my god, when I when I did the album. It was songs that mean a lot to me. Everything that's on the album, you know, it hits a nail on the head for me. And that's why I did it. But that's what what writing and creativity and, and expression is about, isn't it? I mean, you know, we, we go on about who writes things, but sometimes it's who interprets them and does something with them that's just as important in fact sometimes highlights how good the writing is like like i mean roberta flack's version which for a lot of people is seen as the original not everyone knows that was a cover version of the first time ever i saw your face um and going back to that the producer roberta flack's producer said well what what are, you know we can't release this it, it's just sort of you singing quietly and, and a little bit of a bass in the background you know the, there's not enough to it and he, it, it will yeah. never be a hit no one will ever listen to it but actually it, people listen to it because of what she's done with the words and that's what you've done with that song brian it's it's oh, thank you beautifully and thank the you by your friend he's, he's crosby lad isn't he the lad who produced yeah it. it's kevin mccann he's got a studio call <clears throat> um, Time Sky Studios. What a brilliant guy he is. He's a good guitarist, though, isn't he? You oh, can see. <clears throat> well, he's a total fanatic as well. 
not fanatic, but he's like the number one fan of Toto. It's not him that put that CD in the middle of the Sahara Desert that plays Africa <laughs> on a 24 hour loop. Have you heard no, about but that? he looked but he he plays plays a solar powered radio in the middle of the desert, he, he plays and all, all that. it plays he... is Africa by Toto on a yeah. 24 hour loop. Imagine that, yeah. But <laughs> Kevin, it... for airplay for, for their royalties, you know, <laughs> yeah. But he, he plays keyboard and he plays. Like lead guitar, but really, well, they, they were Michael Jackson's backing band, you really? know, back back when he was in the in the heights of his fame. Yeah, Toto were, were basically his backing band. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if you if you look at what they did, um, they I think Marty Page, um, one of the band, or was it who was it? Someone's dad had been a big arranger for a load of um, jazz singers. People like Ella Fitzgerald. He did a few albums for him. Um, Verve records for it. One was called Whisper Not. And his arrangements and orchestrations were like a big part of Ella's act, right? And um, his son ended up in Toto. You know, which, if you think about it, is amazing because, in fact, his son actually did the orchestration on Michael Jackson's track, She's Out of My Life. Mm. Oh. Uh, you know, and yeah. she's out. Oh, that's life. a lovely song. That's a lovely song as well. Man, isn't it? It's like, I mean, we hear all the things about Michael Jackson or the controversies or whatever, but it's, it, it, it is hard, you know, to divide those sometimes for a lot of people. And the fact that when he was creating stuff, he was creating really good stuff. <laughs> he some really, really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Now, just I mean, before we carry on talking, I think Dave has been, he's popped down the road and borrowed a guitar off uh, someone busking at, uh, at the end of the road on Bank Holiday. Have you, well, have you got some, on, what are you going to do for us, Dave? Are you going to, you going to do something of your own or some, a cover or what? what are you um, well, I could give one a try. Um, I haven't played any of my own stuff really in a long time, uh, especially in a live setting. <laughs> uh it's well, got something you want to play. We're we're happy for you to play anything. You know, if you if you want to do a, a little version of one of your own, or you know, um, let me just stay, grab a lyric sheet. See if we can find one. Hang on a second. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> right. But uh, I mean, the one thing about it is, I'm hoping that we can. Now that we got a drummer, um, I'm hoping that we can get the recording band. I've been working with, and unfortunately, we don't have a name. Right. A band but with we... no name. Uh, that that wasn't that. Um, the horse with no name was, was the song, isn't it? Do you don't think after all that time walking across a, a, the whole of America with the horse, one of them would have thought of a name for the thing, you know? <laughs> what was that, Zoe? You just thought so that poor horse, no name attached to it. I mean, how cruel. Exactly. It should never have been a hit, should it? <laughs> I know yeah. when you go on the highway and you refer to someone having no name. That was Clint Eastwood in all them Western films, which were just made, made on the fly, and you know, weren't they really? I think they shot all four of them in one in one day, didn't they? Do you remember the film called A Man Named Horse? Yeah, that was Richard Harris. That was a great film, that wasn't it? Wasn't it a boss film? That yeah, that was did. a good film. What really he good did film. to him in that film? Yeah, he wouldn't get away with it these days because he oh, did geez. all his own stunts, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, with those hooks in his back. Yeah, Jeez. painful stuff. Painful. Right, let's go back to Dave. So, Dave, what, on, what are you going to do for us, mate? Well, this this is probably the one of the first ones I've actually recorded, and I think you've actually played. Thanks, to Kathy, to Andrew for bringing it awareness to the station. So, I'll soon we'll be talking about stripped down songs. This is kind of a stripped down version of it. So, hopefully, it comes well. One, two. Many times in my life, things don't go my way. It drives me completely mad. But even when I'm low, I know you'll be there to show me things are not so bad. In times of frustration, I know things will be okay. me to stand tall again with the words that you say put things in perspective 
make it all so clear. Help me find my inner strength, face the things that I fear. You'll never know what a help you are to me. I'll never know without you where I would be. We'll never know what lies ahead, let's see. But you'll never know what a friend you've been to me. Can't only say I'm grateful. Don't feel that it's enough. You always save me from myself on days where I feel so rough. If you need me, then I'll be there when you don't feel too good. To aid you when you are in need for me, I know that you would. You'll never know what a help you are to me. I'll never know without you where I would be. We'll never know what lies ahead, let's see. But you'll never know what a friend you've been to me. That's brilliant, mate. Love it. What? Lovely song. Yeah, it's probably one, I think it's probably the second one I've ever wrote, mate. really. And um, I'll say, I mean, part of it commemorates Mr. Hesford over there because, oh. you know, he's really been a, a great source of encouragement, really, to me to do this sort of thing, really, because even though these songs are not really out there much, it's, you know, it, it's it's been motivating to keep going, you know. No, it's, it's a great song. It's a bit like the Randy Newman song, You've Got a Friend in Me, isn't it? It's got that sort of uh, vibe <laughs> well, to it. Well, there's a couple. Really. I mean, do you want me to do another one? Please do. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This one's a little bit more tongue-in-cheek. I mean, it was probably more relevant before the lockdown, when life was normal, really. Um, but it's it's about the day, every morning before, when you're heading to work. You probably know. It was kind of inspired really by a friend who, who lives down in London and travelling round on the tube really kind of inspired this one. So here we go. Look up on the wrong side of bed Clear up my lazy sleepy head See the clock it fills me with dread. We're up late to catch the train. The station's back, it's just insane. Panic quickly fills my brain. Train pulls in, now comes to a stop. I can feel my own heartbeat drop. The door's now open, get in, chop, chop. Push it, shove it, get out of my way. Push it, shove it, I'm late today. Push it, shove it, there ain't no room. Train's now full, there's another one soon. Standing on the platform, wasting time. Made to wait is such a crime. Each second feels like a lifetime. This train is ticking much too long. Is it late or is something wrong? Gonna be ready when it comes along. Push it, shove it, get out of my way. Push it, shove it, I'm late today. Push it, shove it, there ain't no room. Train is now full, there's another one soon. Gaze at the floor as I reach that open door. 
that goes on me won't let no more. Pushing, shoving, get out of my way. Pushing, shoving, I'm late today. Pushing, shoving, there ain't no room. Train's now full, there's another one soon. Yeah, pushing, shoving, get out of my way. Pushing, shoving, I'm late today. Pushing, shoving, got a bad day ahead. Train's now full, so I'm going back to bed. Love oh, it. that cracking. <laughs> Uh, cracking they're so different I think I'll, uh, stay that works, that works just as well <laughs> it, it's got a little bit of a tinge of that is it paolo natini who did that i'm gonna pull on my new shoes or new new jeans today do you remember that song yes. new, new shoes new shoes it's got that sort of staccato ness to it you know uh in in, in the pushing shoving the, the yeah, very vibrant, that very part vibrant. of the song yeah we have to record it dave yeah, it, definitely. Well, it, re- it really came about really from like listening to like you know bands like Cream and Led Zeppelin and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, I mean, when, you, when you're that. when you're putting it all together as a you know a recorded song, you you can you can put more in, can't you? You can put a bit more of, of the origin vibe in. But the way you delivered that chorus, then it definitely had that that little you know I'm going to pull on my new my new shoes and it, it just. Bopped along for me, brilliant. What did you I think? Really you it. Like I it? think it's just it draws you in, it's so powerful, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I when, mean, it, so are you joining Andy's band or is Andy joining your band? <laughs> oh, we'll have to negotiate there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, I was standing on the platform waiting for the train to come in. Yeah. No, it's very apt. I mean, they should have it on the loop down on the Piccadilly line, shouldn't they? You, you, you <laughs> yeah. should insist. They should have it, should have it on Mersey Rail, Marge. It might make annoy the, the way. Oh, no, no. Mersey <laughs> Rail runs, runs, runs by the minute, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm just well, so share. does the underground, apparently, but, you know, oh, yeah, still yeah, causing yeah. problems. <laughs> right, I'm just going to um, dig out something else for you to all have a quick listen to. We're only going to listen to a minute of this because um, it, it's more about where writing comes from and where songs come from and unfortunately i'm having a slight problem getting to my uh oh sorry about this as as is the case right now this is meant to be the oldest known song of all time oh Listening to is the Who and Him number six, the oldest piece of music that actually could be reconstructed. It was discovered in the royal palace of Ugarit, northern Canaan, now modern day Syria, and is believed to date back to 1600 BCE, some 3400 years ago. The song itself is inscribed on a small clay tablet and was discovered in the early 1950s, along with 36 other tablets. But the Hurin Hymn number 6 is the only tablet that was preserved well enough to be read and eventually performed. The tablet itself contains instructions for a song on a lyre, an instrument that looks like a small harp and is written in a dialect of the ancient Hurin language. It also includes partially obscured lyrics that appear to be a prayer to Nikal, the goddess of orchards. The version you see on screen is a translation by Hans Johann Thiel and is considered to be the closest to the original spirit of the song. Whilst the Hurin Hymn is the oldest piece of music that can be reconstructed, it is not the oldest song that exists. That title goes to the Lipit Ishtar, which is another tablet discovered in Sumer, modern-day Iraq, but this time from 1950 BCE, roughly 4,000 years ago. It's made up of instructions on how to play a hymn, but the trouble is, it's only a small fragment of a large piece of work and so its instructions do not give us enough information to reconstruct the actual song. Wow, that's intriguing. Very that, African that, sounding. That, that. Well, it's, it's, it's Egypt and, and Iraq and Iran, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. You know, what I found strange, really, is it's always been acknowledged one of the oldest songs that's ever been written was the Egyptian Shadoof song. You know, where he had a gourd and used it to take water from a lower level? Yeah. On a long pole and then bring it up. And then 
wheel it across to the top of the land. Then you bring the empty gold down and you do the same thing again. And the Shadoof, well, the Shadoof is the, I think, the Aramaic or Arabic word for it, you know. But, I mean, it's fascinating, you know, when you think about it, that, you know, there were things where they were calling people to pray um, and they were using sort of those kind of things. And it makes you wonder, you know, what kind of notation or what was the understanding of music theory or whatever at the time, you know. Well, it's, well, it's different, uh, different, part, different parts of the world. I mean, it, you mentioned like scales before, Andrew. There's so many scales that would work in like blues music or pop music here, but you just change one note from it and it can sound something almost Middle Eastern. And so it's really... Well, I think different ones have influenced each other over time. Well, you know, Indian music, you know where a lot of Indian music seems to have this... Um, drone as to play in the sort of long melody. And a lot of Indian stuff has very long melody lines. So there's nothing modal. It doesn't come round again. It tends to go on. So you could have a piece that goes on for about 10 minutes before you progress to the next part of it. And um, remember, a lot of people do get it wrong when they're listening. There was a famous example of Ravi Shankar getting ready to perform a raga at uh, the concert for Bangladesh. And they played this piece, and they were trying to work out um, on this sitar swam mandolin, I think it was uh, called, what was it called, Tabla Tarang, trying to work out this piece. And eventually, he stopped, and the audience applauded and went, thank you very much. If you enjoyed the tuning that much, now we'll play the music. Um, because they didn't know, the, the audience didn't know what it represented or what it was. Um, and yet it's now we're... every song, doesn't it, the, the sitar? It has to be, because... Sitars, when they're in, in use in parts of the world, are subject more than guitars to changes in temperature. And so you can end up where the sitar would actually go um, sharp or flat if you left it too long. And also how you handle it. A lot of people handle guitars very badly, but sitar is treated as almost a holy instrument. Yeah. Isn't his daughter now playing? Um, Ravi Shankar's daughter's now pick, picked up sitar and is, is, is oh, playing. And Producer. But his other daughter, Nora Jones, is a very well known American Indian musician. Oh, yeah, she's superb. I mean, her, her first album, oh, it's stunning stuff. Well, isn't the isn't the sitar made from um, a pumpkin? Is it a pumpkin? I always thought it was made of something like, for some reason, I have in my head, it's something like a, it is something like a pumpkin or similar, but also. There are certain types of things which have a very hard outer shell. And when you dry them, you almost dry like wood. So you can't actually use them in that way. Yeah. But I think we'll, we'll have a look, Brian. We'll see, see if we can do a bit yeah, of research. Check it out, yeah. I think D D Dave's warmed up now, so I think we, we might be getting treated. So okay. We'll get another, well, uh... Give me one minute. I'm just going to top my yep. glass up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dave, oh, Dave he's run running a bit low. I'll have to get the charger. Hang on, on one sec. <laughs> Can you do something else for us? Uh, if you want me to, I mean... We do. It's nice to have people create something live. I mean, you know, certainly for us who are just talking and watching. <laughs> uh, I just have to tune it up because it went out. That's what they say about guitars. Say you use them, abuse them, and they go out of tune. Yeah. Are you, a, are you an ear tuner or have you got one of them little magical things you plug in at the top? <laughs> depends it, it changes really but the guitar has got on you see there's a red light and it's the right hand side of his chest that's a tuner it's a built-in tuner yeah, yeah and it doesn't come with mayonnaise oh very good <laughs> <laughs> is this another one of your own dave um why not because i've not really done many of them This one is, I mean, I think another one Andrew's heard. I think he's probably heard every single one I've done so far. Um, beforehand, uh, this one really is a homage back to where we both first met, really, which was really open mic nights, you know, jam nights at pubs at, on uh, different days of the week. Um, we used to both go to... <laughs> the demos. You gave me the demos. I've listened to all of these. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was... My friends do, you know, I like to hear what they do. 
Right, this one called it, it's it sounds more sordid than what it actually is, but it's not. It's really about uh, <laughs> it's basically about open mic night and people jamming together. Called Playtime. <laughs> Stay home alone. Go grab a guitar. The night has just begun. We're headed down the local bar. Come on up and play. Sing your heart away. Come on up and play. The gem with us here today. Music plays away. Blowing like the tide. Up we go downtown. Come and join us for this ride. Come on up and play. Sing your heart away. Come on up and play. Jam with us here today. Play time. Give us a tune. Set the groove here in this room. Play time. Give us the song. Spread the music here all night long. Let's start as a call. We've had a lot of fun. So let's finish on a high and send out another one. Come on up and play. Sing your heart away. Come on up and play. Jam with us here today. Play time. Give us a tune. Set the groove here in this room. Play time. Give us a song. Spread the music here all night long. Play time. Give us a tune. Set the groove here in this room. Play time. Give us a song. Spread the music here all night long. Yeah. Like it. <laughs> Love it. It's a great, it's it's a it's a real feel anyone. good, real feel good tune. That, yeah. yeah. It's nice to write well, something um, that's about other people without it being about specific people as well. Oh, well, to be honest with you, I, I, I find that I'm often better writing about things that aren't me <laughs> or things I see rather than personal things. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, well, that's an know, interesting like thing, self, isn't it? I mean, I'm into photography, so it's more what I see usually yeah. than what happens to me that usually brings I mean, up. were you not on crosby beach this morning and you, you didn't you didn't tell me to come down i was i was doing my vat return i was busy <laughs> it was a baptism for the dog really <laughs> yeah it went swimming didn't it yeah oh yeah well <laughs> did you see all the jellyfish there last week uh i saw one or two yeah no, the tide were, just came in instantly there were millions. it does Come in there really quick, doesn't it? And millions and millions of them. Yeah, there were this time last year. Babies. I remember going down one day last year, and I was a bit gobsmacked by how many there were. There was literally hundreds of them. Yeah. Yeah, there was like millions all, all along by the tower, by the radar tower. Yeah, but well, at, at the moment, half of the Iron Men have gone have gone off for um, a deep clean. They, they've gone off. To they be have. Clean. Well, I've, I've got a friend who fishes up there by the tower. Um, and his name's Les, and he keeps promising me a cod for about four years. He's, prom he's probably listening now. He's probably watching now, so I'll just embarrass him. Yeah. Where's me cod? Where's your cod? Yeah. Where's well, me cod? He that, promises cause... me a piece of cod all the time, and he never brings it. Yeah, well, I mean, when when we're able to get Ian out and about after, after any time after June the twenty first, government permitting, I, I think fish and chips is order of the day, Andy, isn't it? That's mm. that's his, his greatest desire. Well, on that trip, because I think if if Ian doesn't notice, because he he has suffered quite a lot this year, you know, and we we've got to support him. He's our mate, you know, Absolutely. it's as simple as that. Yeah. So I, I mean, make... uh, Tony made. I'm going to go with him. You know, we stood out, we were outside his house a few weeks ago, and I said, It's a bit like being good cop, bad cop. So I sat down and went, Okay, Ian, did you watch Emmerdale last night? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. And I almost wet himself, and, you know, it wasn't the intention, it was just, it did feel like good cop, bad cop. 
But he, he, I mean, it was a light moment out of a very, he's had a very difficult year, you know, and also he, he can't take the risk that a lot of people are prepared to take because he obviously doesn't want to get ill. No, well, that's no, but, the problem for know, a lot of people clears, with yeah. under, any underlying health issue. Um, so, yes, um, um, Brian, you were pretty much right that it's it's made out of, um, well, basically teak wood and a, um, something akin to a pumpkin that's yeah, dried okay. out as well. Yeah. So yeah. You, you were you were you were pretty much right. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, anyway, good. listen, we've got we've got a tiny bit more time left. I just thought I would play you another thing piece of music by uh this is um a, a chap i know from formby called stephen gerrard not the footballer before you say anything and he, <laughs> he writes about people and places of formby there was a guy who lived famously lived on the beach a hermit called bill tasker everyone just called him tasker actually not not everyone bothered to talk to him find out his name but he was actually called bill and this is stephen gerrard not the footballer's version of a lovely folk song. Just Andy and Dave, just listen to this guitar playing. Bill Tasker was a hermit who lived on Formby Sands in a broken down cabin. Hidden in the dunes He spent his days beach calling For whatever he could find Remnants from another world The one he left behind No one knew exactly why He chose this way of life A soldier from the great war He'd seen a lot of strife some say there were scars from the battle's endless noise Broken and downhearted, he followed his inner voice He was a quiet and solitary man His footprints fading in the sand the Western winds and ever-changing skies shone in his eyes Carrying an old grey sack With a tribe of weary stray dogs And a couple of scrawny cats I watched him from a distance As he followed in his stride As he filled his sack with bits of coal Left by the tide And in his tiny cabin Warmed by an old wood stove Works of Keats and Shelley, a Bible and an old chessboard. On a bed of moss lay a bird with a broken wing. It was his way to be a friend to the smallest of living things. He was a quiet and solitary man. His footprints fading in the sand. Western winds and ever-changing skies shone in his eyes. The years they slowly took their toll. Bill was getting old. He was found by two fishermen, hungry and cold. They sent for Dr. Diamond, but all was in vain. And he left for his spiritual home, as poor as he came. Those who knew him smile and say they see him to this day. As he walks along the shoreline with his canine company. Seabirds follow him so close they could almost touch this man who spoke so little and somehow said so much He was a quiet and solitary man His 
footprints fading in the sand the western winds and ever-changing skies shone in his eyes that's beautiful that mm. that's so wonderful Warhammer yeah, sound guitar. That was nice. It, it goes back really to like their Jansk territory, doesn't it? It's got that sort of it, sound and feel to it. It it does remind me sort of of the use of Bear Jansk. That wasn't who I had in my mind. I was thinking of Nick Drake. Well, yeah, but, but, yeah, it, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, no I mean he's mix. released two albums, Stephen, and he doesn't really go yeah, out and perform out much or anything. Much. I mean, you wish he would. You know, imagine you know a little candlelit concert down in Pinewoods. Absolutely, it'd be rather yeah. good. I mean, it's the time of thing. A lot of folk artists tend to think about uh, performing in terms of it, it's almost like a running joke. You know, they perform in a place where there's that sixty-nine bottles with melted candles in them, and you know, they, they sit in a stool in the corner, and everyone sort of has you know a quiescent mood and listens to them, and then. You know, it, it's not the case anymore. In a lot of places, it, it's that you're fighting with the background noise sometimes. So, so that's why there's amplification and why you've got to really rack up your delivery to get through to the audience, you know. Well, it, 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 it reminded uh, me of, uh, we used to go up on holiday up to Scotland quite frequently because uh, we used to have a caravan up in the Scottish borders and Wob Hub in the town we stayed in used to have uh, evening folk clubs, evenings every fortnight on a Thursday night. And it was just such a wonderful experience. I mean, they weren't loud. They weren't over the top in the volume, no amplification, nothing. But it would go through from, like, songs, similar sound to that, to, like, violin players, to mandolin players. It was just beautiful to hear just different variations of sound with different, almost like being told stories, you know, of various yeah. characters, whether real or... Well, that's, because, that's really you know, what we need to go back to and, folk, and bring folk people folk together. Albums. Bring people yeah. together for stories and a bit of music and, and togetherness. And, and, you know, stop the loudness and the brashness and the watching of things and, and have more of the talking and listening, isn't it, really? Unfortunately, the loudness, the loudness can work, but as long as it's used in the right context, hmm. um, if it conveys, yeah. if it fits the song. Really oh yeah, no. I mean, it's like you mentioned in Cream. I mean, you know, their 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 approach. You know, back in the late sixties, and you know when they did their you know their Albert Hall thing. I mean, you needed the volume to get the get the message of you know the, the their songs across. Uh, mm. But there's, you could still hear every note, couldn't you? Oh mm. yeah. Yeah. Brian, were you going to? Were you just about? Did, were you rattling a bit of paper there, or have I? Me. <laughs> Well, I was, but I, I don't know whether I've, re- I've already said this one. My daddy was a hero. Have I done I, that one? I don't know. Feel free. Don't mind. Let's hear it again, if you have. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, it's, only, it's only rough. It's all rough. I have given it to my daughter to type out at some stage, but this is all bits and pieces that come out of my head. My daddy was a hero. A shindit in special forces, he fought in World War II. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for me and you. He had to leave his family behind when he went off to war. He trained in special forces to fight the Japanese. He fought his way through Burma with an elite elite platoon of men. And some of them he went with were never seen again. Slaughtered in an ambush. When dad returned to base, he had to seek and find the ones that did it and make them seal their fate. They tried to ambush dad one day with his men as they sat around, greasing and cleaning their rifles, the parts all strewn on the ground. They were sitting in the clearing when the Japanese showed their heads, popping up from behind some bushes ready to fill dad's men full of lead. They knew they'd caught them unawares. The Japs raised their rifles high and pointing them while laughing, mocking and taunting. 
and Dad's men froze, paralysed. They knew there was nothing they could do, no sudden move they could make. They all just sat there motionless, with just the breath to take. The Japs arc their weapons round, left to right, sweeping this way and that. I can't imagine what was going through the men's minds as they waited for the rat to tat-tat. With only bits and parts of rifles and the greasy hands, and none of them wanted to leave their life in that godforsaken land. The jungle sounds could still be heard above the scathing jibes. As every soldier sets their minds for ways to stay alive. None of their wembles assembled. None of their weapons assembled, but some of them did try to walk their fingers across the ground rather than to die. The clearing where this all took place was small. And close at hand was a Gurkha about 10 feet away from where the Japs did stand. A sidewood step with lightning speed would draw his kooky blade the sun reflected and danced on it as towards the Japs that came. Split second, it was back in sheath. The English soldiers' jaws all fell. Oh no, the Gurk has missed him. They're sure to go to hell. All time stood still. A moment passed. You could not hear a sound as though all life itself had stopped. Just silence all around. The men all stared in disbelief at what they had just seen, as the Japanese still grinning and pointing their rifles, their hands in a vice-like grip, and nobody knew just what to do. Each one was scared to move. The Gurkha stood there, standing at the place that he had arrived, then suddenly started to laugh out loud as though he had lost his mind. He slowly moved once more again towards the Japanese and placed his foot upon the shoulders of the first. A short, sharp kick and their bodies moved without a sound, but the heads of the Japanese soldiers rolled off and thud thudded as they both hit the ground. Whoa. Whoa. Brilliant. Crack of that. Absolutely brilliant. And that, Absolutely. that is true. My dad told me That's that story thing, many it? times. My dad was in the C4 Highlanders, Brian. Really? And he had to go to India and Burma. Oh. And uh, you mentioned that it was like quite brutal because it was well known that the Japanese would do things like tie you to a tree and slash you to death. Yeah, you know, that's right. Like that. So, he never mentioned if he ever killed anybody, and I often wonder if he did. But it was something that he never gave voice, voice to. And the war was not a glamorous thing. As he said, only virgins and generals keep diaries. You know, he, he wants to forget about it. He wants to come home and raise a family. And Well, that's you know, right. Well, my dad only talked about it on a Thursday night when the insurance man came, right? And he used to come in the house and my mum would make a cup of tea and my dad and him would sit by the fire with the big open, you know, the big black range, big fire range. Mm -hmm. I would sit in the, on the side in the, in the living room and I'd be making models or painting and I would listen to my dad and his mate because they were both in Burma and that's where I remember all the story. He never said it again. And I remember saying to me, dad, dad, did you, did you ever kill anyone? And he just nodded. He never said any more. Oh. The only thing we don't say is towards the end of his life, he did actually say, you know, you did ask me about that once, yeah. He said, what if I told you I did? I said, well, I'd look at it this way, Dad. You're here. You know, you must have had to do something to get to this point. That's right. And uh, he said, well, yeah. you don't think I'm proud of it. That's why I never mentioned it. Yeah, but That's it, it was, it was, the main thing was survival. Survival. Yeah. I mean, 
if if I can locate, I can't locate it at the moment, but if I can locate a couple of pictures, Brian, I'll send them through to you so you can have a look at my dad in his Langari and his uniform. Um, and in fact, his stuff is now in Fort George in the Venice. Um, he, he requested that it all went to the Fort George Museum, which is the Queen's Own Highlanders Museum, which is the successor regiment. And um, it was like they interviewed him for a couple of things. You know, like when you do a living interview, an audio interview, because there were quite a lot of things he was shot at and they burst the water bottle. And as a result, there were no spare water rations and he ended up in a military hospital with amoebic dysentery, um, which meant he, he, he'd actually nearly been killed. He did have a little bit of shell shock, what we'd now call PTSD. But they didn't invalid him out. They just said, OK, then you're intact. OK, you, you've got a little bit of sort of a graze on your hip, but you're quite fit to go back in service. That was the way it was at the time, very steric. You know, but um, we sometimes forget our parents have been heroes. They're heroes well, to his parents. Well, on to I think it's um, talking pictures. It might be talking pictures. They have, um, late on, really about two and three in the morning, they have Burma. With all the stuff, and I, I continuously look to see if I can spot my dad because oh, he would have been there. That'd be something, wouldn't it? I yeah. know because he, he was with he was with the special forces that fought the way into Burma for the American and the English soldiers to follow. He was part of it. But my dad was part because, of the soldiers who defended yeah, the, the, um, the Road, Rangoon. Yeah, 